All right, you have taken the AP test and you have survived and you're out on the other side. The end of the year, we will concern ourselves with philosophy and film. Philosophy because it's really cool and interesting and fun to think about, and movies because they're great and uh, they deal with important philosophical themes. So hopefully you've got that slideshow that I shared. This is what I would have given you in class, uh, but I will be filling up the blanks of understanding it alongside uh, you here. You should also have a Google Doc that you can fill in answers for along the way. So we're going to be talking about basically kind of the basis of philosophy. Today we're going to be talking about Plato specifically and one of his original ideas before we get into um, The Truman Show, which is the movie that we'll be watching this time around. So hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, so first of all, when we're talking about philosophy, we want to first talk about thought experiments. And so the idea of a thought experiment, so a real experiment, you like set up things and you have variables and you test stuff. But a thought experiment is a logical puzzle, essentially, where you set up a hypothetical situation where you logically reason through possible conclusions. So basically it starts with, what would happen if, well, let us suppose that, uh, different things like that. Uh, you might be familiar with the trolley problem. The trolley problem is a thought experiment. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. We'll talk about it uh, when we talk about ethics next time. So let's think about a few different thought experiments that exist. The first most famous one that you've probably heard of as well is called the prisoner's dilemma. What is the right answer? What should you do? And this is a story that kind of gets the idea Tanya and Chinque have been arrested for robbing the Hibernia Savings Plant bank and placed in separate isolation cells. It's very important that they cannot talk to each other. Both care much more about their own personal freedom than about the welfare of their accomplice. A clever prosecutor makes the following offer to each. You may choose to confess or to remain silent. If you confess and your accomplice remains silent, I will drop all charges against you and use your testimony to ensure that your accomplice does serious time. Likewise, if your accomplice confesses while you remain silent, they will go free while you do the time. If you both confess, I get two convictions, but I'll see to it that you both get early parole. If you both remain silent, I'll have to settle for token sentences on firearms possession charges. If you wish to confess, you must leave a note with the jailer before my return tomorrow morning. So the idea is that you have these two people who cannot talk to each other. And if one person snitches on the other, then that person gets to go free as long as the other person doesn't snitch. Uh, same with the other one. If neither of them snitch, um, then, you know, it's still a bad outcome, but not great, uh, but, but not terrible. If both of them snitch, then it's the worst possible outcome. What do you do? What's the right answer? Uh, if we were actually together, this is when I would make you do a prisoner's dilemma. I would have started class with this and I would have split you up and made you do it so that you could experience it. But um, look up prisoner's dilemma if you're still kind of confused. Uh, basically, the idea is uh, how do you make a decision when you can't talk to the other person that you're making a decision with and what are the implications of that? The next one that you might not have heard of uh, is The Beetle in the Box, which is by Wittgenstein. Uh, imagine a group of individuals, each of whom has a box containing something called a beetle. No one can see into uh, anyone else's box, and everyone is asked to describe their beetle, but each person only knows their own beetle. Uh, each person can only talk about their own beetle, as there might be different things in each person's box. Consequently, Wittgenstein says that the subsequent descriptions cannot have a part in the language game. Over time, people will talk about what is in their boxes, but the word beetle simply ends up meaning the thing that is in that person's box. So the idea is, it's kind of similar to the idea, I don't know if you've ever had this conversation, but like, have you ever talked to each other and been like, what if we see colors differently? Like when I see purple, what I call purple and you call purple isn't actually the same purple, man. It's that idea that, I, we all call this purple, but none of us really know if we're all seeing the exact same hues, right? Or if it's just the thing that we have designated purple. In this thought experiment, we each have a box that has what we call a beetle inside of it. But I can never see into your box and you can never see into mine. And because of that, I can't really know if our beetles are the same thing. 
He uses this to kind of talk about consciousness and understanding and whether or not our experiences of the world itself can be compared, are the same, when neither of us can look into each other's heads and experience what it, it's like to, to think or reason uh, in another person's head. So now let's move forward and talk about Plato. Plato was a philosopher who wrote around 380 BC. Specifically, he wrote uh, a text called The Republic at that point. It is comprised of 10 separate books that are more like just chapters, and it mostly discusses the meaning of justice and whether the just man is happier than the unjust man. It gets into the theory of forms, immortality of the soul, and the role of the philosopher and poetry in society. Um, okay, so it's set up as a Socratic dialogue where a man named Socrates is speaking with a man named Glaucon. So it's kind of a conversation. Um, who is Socrates? Who is Plato? Plato was a philosopher who was a student of Socrates. Um, he wrote the Republic. It's kind of hard to say whether it's Plato's own ideas or if he is writing down what he actually saw. It's most likely not his an actual thing that he saw. He's just using Socrates kind of as a mouthpiece um, to get his philosophical ideas across. Uh, Socrates taught Plato. Plato eventually would teach uh, Aristotle, and they were all students of each other there. Socrates ultimately killed for corrupting the youth. Terrible. Getting him to think. It's set up as a Socratic dialogue, and a Socratic dialogue is something where Basically, of Socrates asking questions and getting the other person to agree to a bunch of different premises as time goes on. And you'll see what that means when you actually read uh, The Republic and uh, kind of get to see how it's like, well, you would agree X, Y, Z, yes, and the other person agrees, and then you continue to your next point. You'll kind of see, it's easier to, to see than it is to explain. Uh, and the reason we call it Socratic Seminars, uh, and it's a Socratic Dialogue, is because it's usually based off of questions, right? Would you say that blah, 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 blah? Now, it's not exactly the same because we like to ask more than yes or no questions and it's not really leading somebody into the to an answer. Uh, it's much more interplay. But the reason we call it that is because that's kind of how these sorts of texts are written. Um, Plato, so, so the reason we're talking about Plato is because he had an idea about what reality is and how do we know what reality is. Um, and he wanted to know, or basically he had an idea that uh, was called the theory of forms. So basically the idea of forms is there is a basic true reality that contains the truest form of every single object that exists. Each individual instance is just an example of that truer form. So for every uh, so for every idea there is the purest, most idealistic version of that. Um, so imagine like a table. There is a table, the idea of a table, the form of a table. And every single table that we see is merely an example of that, which is the same for plates and beds, etc. So in general, you have this imaginary world in which you have a table and what that magical, most basic form of a table, the most real form of a table is. Then... You can have, you know, a lay table that has three legs. You can have a table that's round. You can have a table that is uh, square. These are expertly drawn, by the way. You can have all these different kinds of tables, uh, but we all recognize them as tables because they go back to that main, basic, truest reality of a table that exists uh, somewhere beyond our own understanding. Um, and this is why, you know, we can look at a table with two legs, three legs, and still call it a table. We can, uh, same thing with like a person, right? Um, we don't look the same, and yet we know that we are both people because there is some truest sense of person that exists in this mystical form world uh, that then gets disseminated down into every other um, aspect of life. We don't have access to the true forms of things, except maybe philosophers do. Oh man, isn't it so great that Plato and Socrates are philosophers, the only people who have true access to reality? Um, but anyway, at, at, at its base, the idea of forms is there because we want to define the true nature of something and how do we get down to basic reality. How is it that I can have, you know, a dog, you can have a dog, but our dogs are so different, but we still call them dogs. 
Plato's idea is that there's some truest real form of a dog um, that exists. You might be familiar with the term platonic love. Uh, if you love, you know, a, a person. So I might be, I might have a friend that's a female that I would say I love, but I don't romantic love her. I platonically love her. That's named at, based after Plato and his kind of idea of the truest form of love, which doesn't necessarily require anything in return. Uh, and romantic love, you know, tends to have different expectations versus just friendship love uh, in terms of how you relate to that person. Okay, um, so next we are going to talk about the allegory of the cave. I'm going to pause here, give you a chance to read it, and uh, I am going to then have another video in which I talk about it a little bit more and help to break it down because the images can be a little bit challenging. I encourage you to have a pen and paper out and kind of draw along with what you're reading to try to break it down. See ya!